Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Beulah Baptist Church. It's uh, Sunday, what, January 21st, third Sunday of the month already. Boy, that's hard to believe. This is, uh, month is going by quickly. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and open in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for your word. Help us as we read your word. Amen. Okay, we're in uh, Mark chapter 4 today, and um, continuing on from last week's chapter. If you remember, you know, we're, we have a week separation between the chapters, but a lot of this kind of flows together. So Mark chapter 4, and he, he being Jesus, began again to teach by the seaside, and there were gathered unto him a great multitude. So he entered into a ship and sat in the sea, and the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. And he taught them many things by parables, and said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow, and it came to pass as he sowed. Some fell by the wayside, the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Some fell on the stony ground, so it did not have much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased, and brought forth some thirty, some sixty, and a hundred. And he said to them, He that has ears to hear, let him hear. Okay, so this first parable today, Jesus is talking in a parable. A uh, parable being a uh, story with uh, spiritual meanings. And he's talking to an agrarian audience. A lot of them were farmers. Uh, they understood that and the type of soil. And if you buy bad soil, I mean, for example, grass seed. You see the commercials for grass seed in the spring. They talk about this grass seed is better because it will germinate faster and grow roots and everything else. I, I know enough about you know, grass seed about that. So anyway, if you buy old grass seed, you're not going to get as much results as with good quality grass seed, for example. Well, here he's talking about a sower went out in his farm and he put the seed out. And uh, what happened to it? So it sounds like, okay, well, that's a nice story. But there's, a, there's a, as Paul Harvey would say, there's the rest of the story. And that's going to be in Mark chapter 4, 10 to 25. Oh, the next set of verses. So we'll look at that. Oh, and in your uh, little handout, I have Mark 3. It's actually Mark 4. That was my, uh, where it says Mark 3, 10 through uh, 25. That was a typographical error. I have to admit that. Okay. And when he was alone, they were, were about him with the 12, asked him of the parable. Now, the 12, you know, a lot of times we'll read over that at last week in the last chapter they talked about the 12 disciples and the 12 disciples they were Simon Peter he was a fisherman James a fisherman John a fisherman Andrew a fisherman Philip was a fisherman Bartholomew or Nathaniel we don't know what he was Matthew he was a tax collector Thomas of the the twin he was unknown what his background was James son of Alphaeus Thaddeus, or Judas, son of James, uh, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, uh, they, uh, their occupations were unknown, but the people in that time knew about farming, about soil, about grain, about seed. So here in Matthew, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 4, uh, verses 10 through 25, he explains the parable. It's also told in Matthew 13, 10 to 23, and Luke 8, 9 to 18. And when he was alone, he again being Jesus, they that were about him with the twelve, or the twelve disciples, asked him about the parable. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are not or without, all these things are done in parables. That seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear, and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sin shall be forgiven them. And that's from Isaiah 6, uh, 9, Isaiah 44, 18, Jeremiah 5, 21, uh, where Jesus quoted that. And he said to them, know, this, know you not the parable? Then how will you know all parables? The sower sowed the word. In other words, the word of God, the gospel. 
And these are they by the wayside, where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan comes immediately, takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are likewise, which are sown on the stony ground, who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, but so endure for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended." And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. And the cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, the lusts of other things enter in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. And these are they that are sown on good ground, such as hear the word, and they receive it and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixtyfold, and some a hundredfold. And he said to them, Is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed, or not set on a candlestick? Uh, so... There, Jesus is talking about the people, and they hear the word of God. And a lot of times you'll see um, revival services or, you know, healing services or whatever you want to say. And you have people come out, and you have great crowds. Think even of Billy Graham, evangelistic crusades, and other types of uh, crusades, as they call them. And all the people come forward, but not all of them mature and become uh, through their life because they have the cares of the world, Satan uh, attacks them or whatever, and they give up the faith quickly because, you know, it's not convenient, it's hard, um, it's not what they thought, whatever. But he said that those that persevere, those that are into the word, um, such the good ground. They hear the word, they receive it, and they bring forth fruit, some 30-fold, some 60-fold, and some 100-fold. So then in verse 21, he says, is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed and not set on a candlestick? Remember, you know, in this day and age, our, our phones have flashlights on them. It's not a neat invention, you know, but back then, they had torches, they had candles. You wouldn't put a candle under a bed. <laughs> not a good idea. Might give you heat, but when the bed goes up in flames, that's a bad thing. What he's saying is you don't hide a light. You know, you don't, um, you know, or put a bushel over it. And I've told the story before, you know, in the Army, you're taught about light and noise discipline and how far you go out in the, in the field and uh, they have someone on the next hilltop light a cigarette and you can see the flame, you know, a mile or more, more away or hear someone banging a pot and pan and you hear it. You know, light, noise discipline. The, think of the light, you know, one little light switch and the light goes on and the darkness flees. You know, and think about that. You know, one little 60 watt bulb, how much light it can bring when it's totally dark. Uh, For there is nothing hid that shall not be manifested, neither was anything kept secret, but it shall not come abroad. If any man has ears to hear, let him hear. Now notice Jesus keeps saying that. What it means is, listen to what I'm saying. And he said to them, take heed what you hear, and with what measure you meet out, it shall be measured to you, and unto you that hear more, shall more be given. For he that hath, to him shall be given, and he that has not, from him shall be taken, even from which he hath. And remember, Jesus told the parable about the um, landowner. He gave his three servants an uh, amount of money and told him to watch over it while he was gone. He went away on a trip. He came back, and, you know, the one got, you know, doubled the money, the other one got about, you know, half percentage of what he had, and the third one just buried it in the ba- in the uh, backyard and didn't do anything with it, and the uh, landowner said, why didn't he at least put it in the bank so I'd collect interest on it, you know, it, so what he's saying is that, you know, at, and at the end of the, that parable, they take the uh, money from the last person and give it to the one that had the most, so... Okay, verse 26. Here Jesus tells the parable of the growing seed. And he said to them, So is the kingdom of God. If a man shall cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day and the seed should spring and grow up, he knows not how. For the earth brings forth fruit of itself, first the blade, then the ear, and after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he puts it in the sickle and the harvest has come. Okay, Robert, you have a farm, right? Okay, so... When you plant your seed, do you stand there and watch it for days on end? Just stand there and it, you, 
you come back a couple days later, you may see a little, you know, sprout or whatever coming up, but you really have nothing to do with it except if you water it or whatever. You put it in God's hands. You put it in God's hands. And, you know, it'll grow into a corn stalk or whatever or a soybean plant or whatever you – rice? You don't make rice. Okay. Anyway, uh, whatever you're planting, you know, it comes up. You have no control over that. And verses uh, 30 to 34, here Jesus tells the parable of the mustard seed. I like mustard. Anyway, and he said to them, whereupon shall we live in the kingdom of God, or with what comparison shall we compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed. When it's sown in the earth, is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, it grows up, becomes greater than all the herbs, and shoots out great branches, so the fowls of the earth may lodge under the shadow of it. Um, so... And with many such parables spake he the word unto them and were able to hear it. But without a parable he spake not unto them. And when they were alone, he expounded all the things to his disciples. So in other words, when they got together, he would say, okay, if you're confused about what I was talking about, here's the meaning behind it. Now, the mustard plant there. Uh, here, Jesus compares the kingdom of God to a mustard seed. You know, seeds are really small. But look how big a mustard plant is. Imagine, consider also Christianity, how big it grew from just 12 disciples, or later 11, you know, 12 disciples and how big it's gotten through the years. So think about that and how it's grown exponentially. Verse 35 of Mark chapter 4, and the same day when the evening was come, he said to them, let us pass over to the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And they were also with him in other little ships. So a little flotilla of ships went out into the uh, sea, the, uh, the Sea of Galilee. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awakened him and said, Master, do you not care that we perish? Now, have you ever slept through a storm? Now, in this area, you know, we get periodically tropical storms and remnants of hurricanes and everything. Have you ever gone to sleep with a tropical storm out there, wondering, you know, is my roof going to be there in the morning? Is a tree going to fall on the house? You know, it's hard to sleep in the middle of a storm, right? But Jesus is sleeping, so he must have been tired. Have you ever been so tired that no matter what was going on, it didn't bother you? You didn't hear anything. Well, he was tired, and he was sleeping. And they said to him, Master, do you not care that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Little uh, information in your handout here. Uh, the Sea of Galilee is 800, I'm sorry, 680 feet below sea level and surrounded by hills. And winds blowing across the land intensify close to the sea, causing violent and unexpected storms. The disciples were seasoned fishermen who had spent their lives fishing on the huge lake, but in this storm they panicked. You know, imagine when you have fishermen that are afraid for their lives, it's got to be a big storm, Right. I mean, have you ever watched that? What's that show with the, um, you know, they go out, uh, the crab, the... the Thank you, that one. You know, you think about shows like that, and, you know, they're out there in the big waves and everything going, you know, and they're just, that's their job. But, I mean, can you imagine being in a ship, in a boat, whatever it is, and having all that, you know, and Jesus just there, you know, sleeping away and not... You know, not oblivious, but he, uh, he wasn't concerned. And they were saying, don't you care we're going to die? Of course he cared. You know, and how often, and why is it that we often ask God, you know, don't you care about me? Don't you see the storm I'm going through? It could be a storm of illness or financial or whatever. Of course God knows. And he's going to take care of us in the storm. Has God taken care of you in a storm? So think about that. Okay, I want to, have you thought, have you ever realized that what happened here 
was prophesied in the Old Testament. But we're going to look at that in a minute. Uh, turn over to Job 38.11. Actually, let me, uh, let me come back to Job 38.11. Let me do that one last. Okay. Turn over to Psalm 65.5-7. So many bookmarks here. Psalm 65, 5-7, to seven, I'm sorry. By terrible things in righteousness will you answer us, O God, of our salvation, who art the confidence of all the ends of the earth, and of them that afar off are gone to the sea, which by his strength sets fast the mountains, being girded with power, seven of psalm 65 which stilleth the noise of the seas the noise of their waves and the tumult of the people that's uh, psalm 65 uh, five to seven turn over to psalm 89 seven and nine 89 seven and nine Ooh, verse seven that's a great one god is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be reverenced of all them that are about him Verse 8, O Lord God of hosts, who is a strong Lord like unto thee, or to thy faithfulness round about thee? Thou rulest the raging of the sea. When the waves therefore arise, thou stillest them. So that's uh, Psalm uh, 89, 7 and 9. Turn over to Psalm 93, 4. Let me start with, it's only five. Five verses. Let me do the whole psalm. Psalm 93. The Lord reigns. He is clothed in majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength. Whereas he has girded himself, the world also is established that it cannot be moved. Thy throne is established of old. Thou art from everlasting. Verse 3. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift their waves. The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters, yea, than the mighty waves of the sea. Thy testimonies are very sure. Holiness becometh of thy house, O Lord, forever. So that's in Psalms. Those are the three prophecies about what happened here. Let me turn over to Job. Job chapter uh, 38, verse 11. Let me actually start in verse 1. Job chapter 38, verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, so this is the Lord speaking here. So the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if you have understanding. Who laid the measures thereof, if you know, or stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations therefore fastened, or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together and the angels shouted for joy, or who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth, as if it had issued out of the womb, when I made the cloud the garment thereof, and thy thick darkness a swaddling band for it, and break it up for my decreed place, and said, Bars and doors, verse 11, and said, Hither, Hitherto shall thy come, but no further, and there shall your proud waves be stayed. So that was a prophecy of, you know, what Jesus would do in telling the storm to stop the waves and the wind. Okay, let's go back to Job. Uh, verse, verse 38, verses 6 to 7. I just, since we're in Job 38, I just want to bring out another verse here. Number 7. Let me start with 6. Whereupon are the foundations fastened or laid the cornerstone thereof, when the morning stars sang together and the angels for joy okay i have a printout here this is from nasa.gov the u.s government nasa national aeronautics space administration a news release they had september 9 2003 i, I i've been collecting articles for years anyway <laughs> astronomers using nasa's chandra x-ray observatory have found for the first time, sound waves from a supermassive black hole. The note is the deepest ever detected from any object in our universe. The tremendous amount of energy carried by these sound waves may solve a long time problem in astrophysics. The black hole resides in the Persix cluster of galaxies located 250 million light years from Earth. 
2002, astronomers obtained a deep Chandra observation, shows ripples in the gas filling the cluster. These ripples are evidence for sound waves that have traveled hundreds of thousands of light years away from the uh, cluster's central black hole. Uh, let's see. In musical terms, the pitch of the sound generated by the black hole translates in the note of B flat. But a human would have no chance of hearing this cosmic performance because the note is 57 octaves lower than middle C. For comparison, a typical piano contains only seven octaves. At a frequency of over a million, billion times deeper than the limits of human hearing, uh, this is the deepest note ever detected from an object in the universe. Uh, Persis sound waves are much more than just an interesting form of black hole acoustics, said Steve Allen of the Institute of Astronomy and a co investigator. These sound waves may be the key to figuring out how galaxy clusters, the largest structures in the u universe, grow. And it goes on um, a tremendous amount of energy is needed to generate the cavities, as much of the combined energy from 100 million supernovas. Much of this energy is carried by the sound waves should dissipate in the cluster gas, keeping the gas warm, preventing a cooling. If so, the B-flat pitch of the sound wave, 57 octaves below middle C, would have remained roughly constant for about 2.5 billion years. So it goes on. Talking about sound waves in space. And here in Job, a lot of people consider Job to be the first book that was written for the Bible because Moses wrote the book of uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, he wrote those, but Job came first in terms of being written. But here, back then, where God says, where were you when the stars sang for joy? And of course, we read that and we say, oh, it's poetry. But here, you know, according to NASA, according to the government, there's actual sound waves in space. Did you know that? So, I mean, this is, you know, this is from the U.S. government, so it's got to be true. So anyway, this is, um, you know, this is proof, you know, yet more examples of what God's word has said through the years, through the centuries. And people who read that say, yeah, yeah, morning stars sang for joy. Yeah, that's poetry. That's, uh, you know, that's, um, that's not literal. But here it says that stars do sing. Isn't that amazing? So, okay, why well, do want it? Because we had to read out of Job chapter 38, I just thought this would be my chance to, uh, you know. Yes. So, anyway, any comments on today's lesson? Okay, well, thank you for being here uh, because your attendance helps, you know. If nobody showed up, it would be very frustrating, and, you know, we wouldn't have Sunday school, Sunday school. But thank you for being here and those that watch online because, um, you know, hopefully this is uh, edifying. So thank you. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that, you know, even an obscure verse in Job and talking about morning stars singing for joy and their scientific proof of what your word says and so much proof for creation and everything else. Lord, we thank you for all you've done. We thank you for creating us. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for all you've done for us. Please be with us. Please be with the pastor. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being here today. <laughs>